<clears throat> Good evening. Welcome to the opening dinner of the 8th IISS Manama Dialogue Regional Security Summit held under the patronage of His Royal Highness the Crown Prince of the Kingdom of Bahrain, Sheikh Salman bin Hamad bin Isa Al Khalifa. Our ability to convene this international gathering owes much to his vision of a Bahrain fully engaged with the global community. The International Institute for Strategic Studies warmly thanks the authorities of the Kingdom of Bahrain for their support to the Manama Dialogue process. This is not just an annual summit, but a continuous effort by the IISS to promote international cooperation on matters of security and stability in this region. We are delighted to receive here over 370 delegates from 32 countries. Our hope and expectation is that this occasion will be used to advance the quality of international relations between the governments gathered here and to invite a transparent and influential debate on all matters affecting the future of the Gulf and the wider Middle East region. Once government delegations and the influential analysts gathered here return to their homes, the ISS from its headquarters in London through its offices in Washington, Singapore, New Delhi and Bahrain, and with its members based throughout the world, will work to follow up on the issues discussed. The Institute will remain in close touch with analysts and government leaders focused on this region, animating informal discussions when it can. And through our research and published analysis, we shall contribute to a continuous informed public debate on strategic issues affecting the Gulf and wider Middle East. The IISS launched the Manama Dialogue in 2004 following the successful experience we had in Singapore with the Shangri-La Dialogue begun in 2002 that has developed into the most significant institution for defense diplomacy in the Asia-Pacific. Our perception was that the model of informal intergovernmental dialogue that we had built in Asia could be nurtured and developed in this region. Our first dialogue was a great success and each year built on the success of the previous summit. By 2010, the Manama Dialogue had clearly established itself as an informal intergovernmental summit. During it, hundreds of bilaterals were conducted, and each delegation was led by a senior ministerial figure, including one head of state. In 2011, we agreed not to convene a dialogue summit in December of that year. But while we paused, we did not stop, and in fact stepped up the momentum. In February 2012, and again in October 2012, we convened two Manama Dialogue Sherpa meetings here in Bahrain. At each meeting, some 45 government officials gathered, drawn from most of the Manama Dialogue participating countries, diplomats and military leaders who worked with the IISS to discuss in detail issues that would be raised at this summit. No summit can be climbed without the help of Sherpas, and I want to thank the many officials who contributed to our discussions and helped us refine our agenda for this dialogue. Our ability to build the Manama Dialogue process has been hugely enhanced by the ISS Middle East office that we have developed in Bahrain. Over the year, we have strengthened our regional office in Manama that now has 16 staff members from eight different nationalities. Most recently, we have appointed two Bahraini research analysts, both young women who have been Crown Prince scholars, Islam al Tayyab and Wafa al Sayed, as research analysts. The ISS is also based here in Bahrain, Ms. Enikin Tik Ringas from Estonia, one of the leading global experts on cybersecurity and the law. Earlier, we appointed, connected to this office, Sanjaya Bauru, formerly business editor of the Business Standard in India and before then a close advisor to Prime Minister Manmohan Singh in India as director of our program of geoeconomics and strategy. Throughout 2012, we held numerous international conferences, seminars and lectures in Bahrain on geoeconomic issues ranging from currency wars to trade and security matters. The ISS Middle East office 
housed here will cover regional issues from the Levant to North Africa and thematic questions of geoeconomics, geostrategy, demographics, and cybersecurity, amongst others. It will further develop programs and activities while always supporting the Manama dialogue process. Here, this weekend, we have delegates from Azerbaijan to Yemen, and we gather at a crucial time. Already, we have held a vitally important opening session on Syria from a global perspective. The debate just completed with Mustafa Sabah of Syria, Chairman Mike Rogers of the US Select Committee of Intelligence in Congress, Wu Siki, China's Special Envoy to the Middle East, and Deputy Foreign Minister Nachi Koru of Turkey, has shown again the value of drawing to the dialogue the key actors of the moment in the regional security scene. I look forward to hearing more from these individuals and others in the plenary sessions tomorrow. During the weekend, we shall be inviting North American, European, and Asian perspectives on regional security priorities and discussing the issues surrounding intervention and mediation of conflict, Syria and regional security, maritime security challenges, counterterrorism, strategic reassurance and deterrence, and the influence of sectarian politics on regional security. We will conclude with a wide-ranging discussion of Middle East security in a global context. The IISS has no specific agenda of its own in framing these discussions. Our purpose is to provide a congenial atmosphere in which quiet but effective diplomacy can take place to advance intelligent public policy goals in the interests of peace and stability. During the summit, our research staff is taking the opportunity to provide briefings to government delegations on regional security issues covered in our publications. And certainly the points here raised will inform our future analysis of regional issues. Throughout this summit, I hope that we can promote together the spirit of intellectual provocation, reasoned debate, and practical diplomatic cooperation that rightly characterizes the best gatherings of this kind. Against that background, we are delighted that a champion of these three principles is with us here tonight. There is no better person to help us relaunch the Manama Dialogue Summit Series than His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince of Bahrain. We are all looking forward to some introductory reflections from His Royal Highness. The floor and this podium is yours. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Kingdom of Bahrain. It is indeed a great pleasure to see you all here. I genuinely extend my thanks for your time, your energy, and your effort in making this journey in circumstances that um, require us to be quite reflective and introspective and considerate uh, when dealing with the matters at hand. I would like to thank you, sir, and the IISS for all of the great work that you do uh, around the world, the great work that you did last year here with the Sherpa meetings, and especially for reconvening the Manama Dialogue at this critical time. I think I would like to start by outlining some regional challenges and interests that are shared by many governments around the world. Nuclear non-proliferation, probably in the forefront of many of your minds. The rise of extremists compounded by potential entrance of, God forbid, chemical and biological weapons from nation states which seem to be failing at the present time. The resultant threat from terrorism, from that god-awful eventuality, is something that we must all be genuinely concerned about. Third. Oil security, something that is rarely talked about these days, but is still critical to the recovery of many economies around the world, especially in the United States, and maybe more so in Europe. Number four, the promotion of democracy and rule of law 
This has been a long-standing goal of many governments, especially in the West, and I don't see it changing anytime soon. And for the United States in particular, it's managing its relationship with the state of Israel and the stalled peace process, which is important to us all. So those are five real heavyweight security concerns that I'm sure many of you um, consider. I would like to draw the attention uh, of the audience to the fact that all of those serious challenges were present before the so-called Arab Spring. These are not new, but in fact, managing them through this turbulent, uh, turbulent time has gotten a lot harder as the instability in the region has grown. Consider this, never before has such a surge in democratic rights and threats to freedom been so apparent at the same time. The outcomes of the tremendous change that we are seeing across the region have yet to be determined to be benign or, if I may say so, malign. So we must always keep a vigilant eye on where we are headed. The response from the international community has been mixed. Those governments in the West, or there are some governments in the West, that are criticized for doing too much, and at the same time, doing too little, which smacks to me of a need to refocus our efforts, or, or, the, or the efforts of those particular governments, to be more effective and more targeted and more in line with a coherent international public policy. The governments in the East, however, are seeking new ways to engage with our region, the Arab region, the Islamic region, and are deploying their growing influence to take advantage of the rapidly shifting global order. This is a reality and it must be recognized. Add to that the power of the information of the information age, either through the many satellite TV channels, which in my opinion were the real game changer uh, um, on the um, information um, uh, landscape, or the modern phenomenon of social networks, and you have the added challenge of the reach and speed by which events can rise is compounded by a factor that is unseen in human history. It is a tall order indeed, and I'm sure these subjects will be, dis will be discussed uh, over, over this weekend, as they need to be. We must realize, ladies and gentlemen, that we are dealing with a new Middle East. Make no mistake. Anyone who doesn't recognize that is, is fooling themselves or deluding themselves. It is, however, my thesis that it is the, the tried and true tools of statecraft that will let us emerge from this tumultuous time with the least human harm done. And let me explain that from a personal experience. You are aware we had our own experience with the so-called Arab Spring last year. It delayed the Manama Dialogue and caused a lot of harm to the society of my beloved kingdom. In our case, it divided the nation. And while relative calm has returned to the kingdom, there are many wounds to be healed on all sides. I would like to take, though, this opportunity to thank those who got us to this point of relative calm. First and foremost, the member states of the GCC. Thank you. In particular, notice must be given to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, without whom, whose actions and words, we would have been in a far different place. They did not put their young men in the face of danger or their money into developmental projects to subjugate the people of the Kingdom of Bahrain. They did so to deter any external aggressor from taking advantage of what was then a very, very difficult and unpredictable and uncertain time. So to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and to the United Arab Emirates, 
we will never forget your stand during our difficult time. I would personally like to thank many in the West who were very kind to me and what I had tried to achieve by promoting dialogue between all of the disparate groups here in the Kingdom of Bahrain. Your support to me has been invaluable over the difficult, past difficult 18 months. However, I would in particular like to thank the, dip well, the diplomats, the leadership, and the government of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth of the UK. You have stood head and shoulders above others. You have engaged all stakeholders. You have kept doors open to all sides in what was a very difficult and sometimes unclear situation. Your engagement and your help in police reform, in judicial reform, your direct engagement with the leadership of the Kingdom of Bahrain and with members of the opposition has saved lives. And for that, I will be personally eternally grateful. Thank you. I would like to thank those in the East who received us with open arms, the governments of Singapore, Korea, and Japan. You deserve our thanks and our respect. Thank you very much. And moving on from, from state actors, I would like to thank the members of the BICI, the Commission, the International Commission, which did the investigation into the abuses and the reality of what took place last year. It was an unprecedented move by a government to invite eminent human rights lawyers and um, investigators to the kingdom to document exactly what had happened. It is through that good work that we have a realistic picture of what occurred last year, and it fundamentally, and I cannot stress this enough, it fundamentally changed the political landscape of the kingdom. It allowed for a calming of the events which were taking place. It created a unified discourse or document which outlined what had indeed taken place, and it prevented many people from exaggerating events or, to, or spinning events, let me put it that way, in a manner beneficial to their particular point of view. So I'd like to thank them. I would like to thank internally uh, our, minis our Ministry of Interior, which has been extremely forward-leaning in pursuing reform agendas, whether it's training police or changing their tactics on the ground. And under very difficult circumstances, there are over 1,700 police officers wounded, many, some who have lost their lives. They have continued to maintain the discipline required to help facilitate an environment which brings people together. But, ladies and gentlemen, security is not the only guarantor of stability. Without justice, there can be no freedom, and without freedom, there can be no true security. I believe that the way forward for the Kingdom of Bahrain is as follows. The government of the Kingdom of Bahrain, I believe, has, done, has taken significant steps, but more work needs to be done. Specifically, reform and capacity building in the judiciary. I believe, fundamentally, that only through the genuine application of a just and fair and inclusive legal system will people feel that their own rights and their own futures are protected. So we must do more to improve the training and, and capacity of our own judges. We must do more to change laws which still can, can lead to in my opinion, judgments which go against the protections guaranteed in our Constitution. We must do more to stop the selective enforcement of law. This is key. This is what will build trust across the whole of the society here in the Kingdom of Bahrain. And also, 
the responsibility does not lie solely with those who are in a position of authority. Political figures who disagree with either the constitutional structure or the performance of the government must condemn violence. Silence is not an option. I call on all of the senior leadership of those who disagree, including the Ayatollahs, to condemn the violence on the streets unequivocally, and more, to prohibit it. Ladies and gentlemen, unleashing people power means that we must respect the opinions of people. And there is a silent majority here in the Kingdom of Bahrain who feel their voices are unheard. They are the ones who go to sleep at night with no security on their gates. They are the ones who lived in mixed communities, representing different sects, ethnicities, political beliefs. They are the ones who have to live day to day with the specter of a sectarian conflict erupting that may damage themselves or their own interests, their future or their children at any time. And that cannot be allowed to happen. Responsible leadership is called for. And that is because the majority of the people of Bahrain want a solution that puts the events of last year firmly in the past, and I believe that dialogue is the only way forward. Geopolitically, demographically, and historically, the differing political views represented in different or disparate political groups here in Bahrain must be reconciled. And they will only be reconciled by sitting together and agreeing a framework where the limit of what is acceptable is the limit of what is unacceptable to the other. With the ultimate goal being to reach an agreement. So, we have our work cut out for us. But the international community must play its part. Wishing for peace never works, but peacemaking does. I call on our friends in the West to engage like the United Kingdom has done. Engage all stakeholders, train all groups, work with us to make our environment, our capacity greater and stronger. Stop exclusively scrutinizing government actions alone. There is a moral responsibility on all sides to work to bring the Bahraini body politic together. We must heal these wounds. We must stop the violence. We must reduce the fear, and we must stop the bigotry. I call on you unequivocally to condemn violence if ever it occurs. We will continue to do our part, but you will help us all if you do yours. Ladies and gentlemen, I am not a prince of Sunni Bahrain. I am not a prince of Shia Bahrain, I am a prince of the Kingdom of Bahrain, and all mean a great deal um, to me personally. And I soon hope to see a meeting between all sides, and I call for a meeting between all sides, as I believe that only through face-to-face -face contact will any real progress be made. It even doesn't have to be on a very serious subject. But meetings must start to take place to prevent us sliding into an abyss that will only threaten all of our national interests. As we, here in the Kingdom of Bahrain, although small, are large in what we symbolize, what we represent, and what we have achieved. His Majesty, the King of Bahrain, was a pioneer of the reform process here in the Middle East. We started well before September the 11th, and we continue to commit ourselves to move forward in the future. So, all I can say is, history has taught us that the path to progress is not always linear. There are setbacks, there are challenges. But if we hold the human, if we hold human dignity, human security, and justice, above all else, then we will prevail. If we fall into the dangerous area of sectarianism, 
false, misplaced nationalism and isolationism, then history also teaches us that failure is not far behind. So I urge you to wish us well in our endeavor, and I wish you well in sorting out maybe for you some of the more relevant problems that you have come here to seek to address. Thank you very much.